Which one's the best crypto asset? Well, Bitcoin's the best crypto asset. Okay. What's the second best? There is no second best. There is no second best crypto asset. Hello, friends, and welcome to the Why Bitcoin Show. I'm your host, Dale Warburton. It's a weekly podcast on why Bitcoin matters and what makes it completely different to all other cryptocurrencies. If you're interested in Bitcoin and you'd like to distill crypto fact from fiction, you've come to the right place. And we're live. All right. So I'm very pleased to introduce my next guest today, Merrick from uh, Amber. Welcome to the show. Hey, Dale. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Yeah, really good to finally have a conversation on my part. It was really cool to chat on yours. And I think yeah. you probably, you mentioned something to me on your part and it left me thinking afterwards. And I was like, ah, oh, I feel like a bit of a dick because you were one of the first people I spoke to about thinking about doing a podcast. So it's just like, <laughs> I didn't even give you credit. So you, you should get a, you should get some credit too. Because I often said, Jake kicked me in the ass, but I think, you also inspired me because when you came and spoken uh, at, geez, which bush bash was it now? Was it um, Mara? Mara, yes, that was yes. at Mara. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and um, I was like, okay, awesome. I've got to get in. I've got to go and chat to this dude. You had a really interesting presentation, and I thought, like, yeah, man, you've got to do it. And to be honest, I was just a chicken. Uh, I didn't do it for such a long time, and yep. uh, I'm so stoked to be on the journey. So you played your small part, however small it might have been at the time, you know? Yeah. I mean, it's, I think putting yourself out there comes with the, the fear of being judged. I yes. think that's the main, yeah, that's the main thing that would hold someone back. Yeah. You're spot on. Uh, that's exactly what I was thinking. It was like, you know, when people said, why don't you just do it? I said, I don't actually have any, I don't know what I'm going to say that's valuable, but yeah, it's exactly that. It's that, it's that judgment, but it was ultimately the support of the community that kicked me in the ass because I don't know if I necessarily had it in me organically, even though I'm someone who's got confidence, it was still just like, I don't think I'm that unique. I don't think I've got anything unique to say. I mean, how am I going to beat Peter McCormick, you know? <laughs> <laughs> and like, and yeah, I, I mean, I can, it, it's pretty obvious that you are more confident, like as I, if I compare myself to you. And then for me, it was the total opposite. Like, because I'm not confident as like, no, nah, I have to do this podcasting. I have to put myself out there. I'm still, I still don't do it on video. I still get annoyed listening to my own voice in the <laughs> recordings. I think that's, I, I've heard from many people that's common, but yeah. yeah. Yeah, totally. And I think, you know, what you're saying is as someone who's not necessarily kind of um, someone who would put themselves out in the spotlight, you actually, you went and did something really difficult and it's like, you've got some sort of mental strength because uh, it's not necessarily within your strengths and maybe we'll talk about jujitsu later because that's also about putting yourself in very uncomfortable positions <laughs> yes, yes. And, and and getting beaten up day in day out and then eventually progressing i'd like to just start off today by touching at kind of a high level how you first got introduced to bitcoin everyone's story is different and i don't actually know yours so i'd love to hear a little bit about that yeah for sure the first touch point with Bitcoin, I mean, yeah, I, I'll go. I'll start with the first touch point with Bitcoin, I guess. It was back when I was 17, maybe probably 16, 2010. This is 2010, right? I heard about this thing on the internet. You have to download a few softwares, keep your computer plugged in and the internet on, and you can make some money. I was like, okay, cool. We'll give it a go. You download these softwares. There's like this... I don't know what it was doing. I just downloaded it. I followed the instructions, plug and play. It said uh, there's this important string of characters that you keep safe. It's like, okay, keep it safe. So best thing I could do was write it on a sticky note, put it in my drawer. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. Rock so solid. That's, so, that was a, so that was my first touch point with Bitcoin. But then, and I had that mining software running linked to this DOS-like looking it was a wallet back then. I can't remember what it was called, but it had it was linked to that. And uh, there was no BIP39. So uh, so there was no seed phrase. So there was that long string that you had to keep. Uh, yeah. So, but at the same time, I was uh, playing Counter-Strike, this computer game, right? So my Counter-Strike started getting really laggy. So after a week of having this Bitcoin thing running on my computer, I deleted everything. 
<laughs> oh, gosh. oh dear. Uh, yeah, I didn't know thing about it. I just said, oh, I can make some money. And it's like that was the like first effort. And then yeah, fast forward 2017, we just had like extra spare cash and it's like, okay, gotta I mean, I always had it like I used to work in I used to work as a banker, so I know like the va- value prop of like having some funds aside for the future, blah, blah, blah. But mm-hmm. then where's the best place to keep these funds? And that's when I started looking more into first first into bitcoin and then there's like oh diversify right so again so then we started looking at these other cryptos and like finding out what's the best or blah 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 but so then yeah back in 2017 come back to it from an investment perspective and then towards 2019 as like yeah that's when i totally like oh no all these other coins are crap and there's only one yeah so that's <laughs> there's like no second story. best yeah, there's no second best exactly exactly so because the show is the why bitcoin show and i want to touch on crypto um i typically think the usual percentage that i've been nailing is like sort of 80 to 90 percent bitcoin 10 percent crypto so maybe we do the 10 percent crypto now because you mentioned it talk to me a little bit about now how you see crypto differently to bitcoin and and what's your kind of well, yeah what's your model around that particular difference i mean as as you said, like there's no second best, but why there's no second best as to like, I think Kanut puts it best that you, you can create, I forget the term he uses, but basically an asset that doesn't have inflation, you can create only one of it, creating another asset or another money that is inflation proof is just creating more inflation. Okay. So yeah, that's the idea behind it as to like why just one, yeah. One money is required. Oh, and then these other, I mean, it gets very obvious when you start looking at these other cryptos, like what's the agenda? Like they try to, they, they try to have some use case behind it. It's like selling uh, reward points or something, right? Like they're trying to sell you reward points as money. Mm. Mm. Yeah. 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 I, I think. I don't know if this is the right term that Knut uses, but it's like you, you can only create absolute digital scarcity once. Yes. Um, something to that effect. But mm-hmm. yeah, I think, I think yeah, I mean, what you're talking about really there is that kind of Bitcoin is money. All these other things that claim to be money, they can't really be money. Um, and that's a that's a common sort of way that I think most Bitcoiners tend to view it. And yeah, let's not, let's not beat on that drum anymore. I'm happy to let, let that one lie because I think... Um, yeah, I suppose that's the easiest differentiation that I've got. Unless you've got anything further to add on the crypto side, eh? No, no, nothing further. But it's like it goes back to like if there's there's going to be an asset that can be created digitally. So then it begs the question whether it, like it's that old argument whether it is an uh, discovery or whether it was an invention. Mm-hmm. Because like if you go down that path, if it's going to be, it's there something that's digital. It's just waiting to be discovered. But then the other aspect is like you need all these other building blocks for it to be invented. So yeah, I, I'm not sure where that argument lies. Mm. But yeah, but it's but it was waiting to be discovered in our digital realm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, fair enough. Okay, that makes sense. So what I was interested to find out though is like when you think about money, and both of us have come from BRICS nations. Oh, you know, we're going to take over the world, apparently. Um, <laughs> but I'd be interested to understand a little bit about your upbringing in India and sort of your beliefs around money. As I understand, Indians are actually, it's one of the populations that has the highest amount of gold yes. per household or something like that. And I'd love you to just to share a little bit about that, because to me, that's, that's quite a fascinating sort of cultural difference, because South Africans, yeah, no, we we not too big on the gold yeah i'm not sure from where the fascination of gold comes to india even uh, like personally like uh from the region in india that i'm brought up or that i've lived my whole life comes from a very uh christian dominated place which is which is like a small pocket in india you could say right like it's an isolated area like the suburbs that i lived around is dominate like it's like there's churches everywhere not temples and the people around me are like 90 percent are like roman catholic so culturally like quite different compared to the broader population 
but there's still the fascination for gold so even though it's like broad uh, like roman catholic there's like yeah there's people my dad used to joke like there's people from my mom's side of the family or that community because my dad's from a different region mom's from a different region and even though both are roman catholics but they're different regions and there's like these people are my mom's side of the family is like more like likes to flash gold and they're like wear like these big heavy yeah yes. like even the men right like the but like the some fascination for it i'm not sure where that comes from i guess it's like uh, yeah i'm not entirely sure like where that comes from but there was always this history of these old temples that are filled uh, that the statues in there have all gold ornaments and then by, when india was invaded there's like first by the arabs the statues were broken down gold stolen then by european nations similar things happen mm. and apparently there's a there's a temple that has like these uh, I'll, i'll shoot you a link or if, if maybe you could put it in the show notes quite fascinating because there's this hidden uh, i'm mean, not a hidden wall but there's this hit, massive door underneath a temple never been entered but apparently behind that door is the most amount of gold it probably like if it, someone has access to it it could uh, yeah topple the gold market i'm not sure if that's true but that's the theory uh, never heard of it Yeah. Okay. Wow. Yeah, that is interesting. And then just around sort of when you grew up, I mean, and you said you were in banking and that sort of thing. Um, did you ever think about what fiat was? And did you, I mean, was that even something that registered on your mind, fractional reserve banking and that kind of stuff? Yeah. I mean, before I go there, I just wanted to point out one thing, like something my grandmom used to say in the in the local language, but what she was in the, saying is the money doesn't have value anymore. and i was like i don't know what you're talking about like like this was when i was young i was asking her for cents back then it was like yeah a rupee i mean 50 rupees makes up a uh, australian dollar so i was asking her for a fraction of that right to go buy some sweets or whatever and then and then i was like oh earlier i used to ask her for a rupee and then now i'm asking her for 10 and then soon i'm been i had, I had been asking her for 100 and she's like oh this this is it's like why do you need like 100 rupees i was like oh because i need to buy blah 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 she's like oh things are getting so expensive this money doesn't have any value anymore and like cuz cuz because she was using a denomination of money that was below the rupee even so there's like have you have dollar for cents yes. there was like rupees and paise that was wow. that's yeah not existent anymore but there was like this other current like this other denomination before you get to a rupee even and that's what that was being used at my grandmom's time and then inflation right yeah and uh, yeah with my banking experience because i worked because i started as a junior banker and then worked into different areas of uh, at, at branch level banking it really boggled my mind that there's like as per our books we have say 100000 for all our customers but in our vaults we just have to maintain 10% of that right so there's like yeah so where's the other money and then oh the other money is with the reserve bank and then 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 there's like thousands of banks all over india who have like the similar model and the rest of the money is in the reserve bank but then actually there's no physical money right like it's all uh, digital and yeah yeah so then exactly and i also worked in the banking uh, yeah in the banking industry while during the time that india went through the demonetization phase that's when i don't know if you're familiar with this but that's when the government i think it was a saturday evening probably a sunday evening the government says the highest denomination notes that being the 1000 and 500 rupees yes uh, yes yeah yeah are not money anymore now it's just yeah that's not money anymore as of now as of as he announced it that's not money anymore and then, so these are like little seeds being planted in you that's just like going yes. what's actually going on here because I, and now that you mention it yeah i do remember that it was like and didn't that create some sort of rush to actually just get rid of all these particular yes. notes that were go, soon yep. to be worth absolutely nothing i mean yeah it's a very strange situation isn't it it, it is yeah cuz cuz i was working in the banking industry then right like so every few days we had new laws and like and that went on for like 3 weeks or 4 weeks yeah and like one day it's like oh people can exchange up to 10000 rupees for example next day it's like only old people can exchange money today next day it's like something else and then then something else and something else and kept going on 
And what happened in the background of all this is like a black market got created because you are, as an individual, you are limited to how much you are, could exchange, right? So the black market deal was you can buy, basically it worked around gold again. Mm. So it's like you, if you're using your old currency notes to buy gold, you get gold at a extremely higher price. But if you use like the new currency, you get gold at a extremely reduced price. Yes. Yeah. yeah, the black market is always firstly the existence of a black market is always the first indication that something's not right. Yeah, uh, particularly when it comes to money, and then also the black market is the the true value, whatever the yes. stated value. I I read a the, book. the free market value. Yeah, exactly. That's the free market value. I've read a yeah. I've read a few books by this chap called um, Jim Rogers. He's like a, he's an investor who's traveled around the world, and very interesting dude. And um, yeah, like he, he, the first thing he does when he goes to new markets is he tries to establish, is there actually a black market for uh, this particular currency? Because he'd go across the border and there'd be one official rate and be like, no, 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 I'm going to try to find out what the real rate is here for yeah. my dollars. Um, yeah, that's interesting. So these seeds are all planted and mm. I'm not sure what the story is currently in India, but are there things like capital controls to stop people from sending money out of the country and that kind of thing today? Yep. Yep, yeah. pretty much. Yeah, they've introduced like a new law just probably a month ago, maybe two months ago. Don't quote me on this, but from my understanding, or at least with I saw someone breaking the breaking down what exactly the law was. So if I'm in India and I'm paying, say, Amazon like Audible subscription, and Amazon Amazon does have an Indian entity, but for like for the purpose of this, like for an example say Amazon didn't have an Indian entity and it was only based in the US. So technically I'm paying for this subscription to a US entity. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to be taxed on all the subscription payments. Wow. So say if, yeah, so say if it was Netflix and yeah, I'm paying, a ta so I, I pay the monthly subscription fee plus a tax on top of that. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> and, and it all adds up. So you all, so you do have like a, a window of, let's say $10,000 but that's including your travel. So you travel to the States from India and you're going to be spending five, uh, you're spending $5,000 there. Then you've used up your $5,000. Then you're using for your subscription services, another thousand, two thousand dollars Then that's reduced. And then over and above that, then you start paying this ridiculous tax amount. I think it's 30%. It's insane. And I think what a lot of, um, I guess, uh, most of our audience is probably Australian and mm. You know, we, we tend to like, we look at the US and we go, oh, fiat currencies are all bullshit, blah, 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 blah. But then you're like, well, hold my beer. You should see what uh, the rupees like or the rand is like. And then you start realizing actually all the rules they have in place to stop people from actually trying to actually store their, their value in something actually worthwhile. In South Africa, again, these, these figures might be slightly off now, but if you want, you can move out up to it's about seventy thousand dollars out of the country per annum per person so per tax uh, payer right you can invest that offshore and that's gone and then but you obviously still pay tax on all the gains and all that jazz yep as long as you're tax resident and then the other thing is if you want to move more than uh it's 10 million rand so it'd be like something along the lines of like seven hundred fifty thousand aussie you need to talk to the reserve bank Okay, so wow. if, you, if you're someone, you need to get their approvals. <laughs> you can imagine, yeah, you can imagine, yeah. and that that is like apparently the form to get that done is like that long. So you want to buy like a property offshore, you know, you want to buy an Australian property, like not even a big one. Yeah, you're going to need to speak to Reserve Bank in South Africa. So wow. yeah, this is, this is what this is. Uh, you know, a Alex Gladstein would say, check your financial privilege because it's all mm. relative. I think whether you're, you know, here in Australia, I'm, I'm like I'm stoked to have the Aussie dollar, even though we know it's losing value. It could be a far worse situation for me um, in South Africa. I always remember that too. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Uh, ha have you read the sovereign individual? Oh yeah. Yeah. Big yeah. fan. Yeah yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 I mean, I, the, the gist of it at the end of the day is I think eventually governments are going to be competing for citizens and I think they're going to be competing yes. for talent. And a lot of those people with talents and capital are going to be Bitcoiners. Mm. and um, they're going to create really friendly jurisdictions. And that's my that's my dream. I'll see that mm. in the next decade, probably. Mm. Uh, speaking of uh, India, uh, another insane rule India has around Bitcoin 
is for someone to sell Bitcoin, that being uh, an individual or an entity, an exchange, they have to source the Bitcoin in India. Jeez, how do you even how do you even <laughs> ensure that? Hey, I think the uh, the Reserve Bank of India is stamping the UTXOs. <laughs> God, that just, that's just it's so insane i think that's an example where it seems as if a government you know, bureaucrat made some sort of rule and it just can't really have any proper application in the real world because i mean how on earth can you fully trace the origins of must be indian bitcoin i mean that makes very yeah, little sense yeah. Did you, did you guys have something known as Havala transactions? If you know what Havala transactions are, I can know. Okay. So in India, India actually this started with uh, the Gulf countries and India or Dubai and India with the mafia. Mm -hmm. Because yeah, there's like mafia from India that have moved to the Gulf, vice versa. So basically it is, say, if I have money in Dubai and I needed to send it to my family in India, for example... I can go and give some individuals in Dubai the cash and my family will get delivered cash in India. Mm. <laughs> yeah. Like uh, not, not gun runners, but cash runners basically. Yeah. 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 It's the thing I, the thing I love, and this, this seems to be the case in India, in South Africa, all of these mm. developing nations, these people are so, they're actually like really creative. They find great yes. ways to get, to to get out of like really stupid laws and things that are holding me back. And it doesn't surprise me in the least. No. And so that's international, right? Like from what I understand currently it's happening. There's like a major boom of it happening locally. And now there's Bitcoin involved as well. Gosh. So yeah. So it like, complicates things. Uh, I, I don't know. Depending on how, how savvy someone is, you could buy, what do you say kyc free bitcoin for it like you are just using cash mm -hmm. right like you can just exchange cash give pay it to someone yeah pay it pay to someone's family going back to the same example and that other individual will send you the bitcoin you don't have to meet in person but yeah there's trust involved in such things of yes course. Yeah. yes exactly very hard to extract trust but yeah that's interesting hey well, no, anyway, yeah. So I thought it'd be cool just to talk a little bit about your background and, and how it relates yeah. to money because yeah, I many of the things you're saying, I mean, they, they're very different to my experience, but at the same time, it's just like I, the the themes are, are the same or let's just rather say it rhymes, you know, it's not exactly mm -hmm. the same. I want to shift gears and I'll talk a little bit about your time here now in Australia. We're very blessed here in Australia to have more Bitcoin exchanges than the U.S., as far as I understand, Bitcoin only exchanges. Let's be clear about that one. And I guess what I was keen to just unpack there was some of the challenges associated with running an, an exchange in Australia. And there's a couple different themes that I sort of would love you just to touch on at, at a pretty high level. Um, I guess the one is we've got a lot of competition here. So it's, it's um, you know, I suppose it would be much easier if there was one only. In South Africa, they got literally one bitcoin only exchange and by the way they shut down last month yeah pretty sad but and i'm trying to figure out what happened there but i think we've got five so yeah how does one deal with the competitors then you've got your shitcoin casinos which have tons and tons of marketing dollars and how do we compete with them and then um yeah I, let's leave it at that and then maybe we can touch on some yeah other for teams. sure yeah yeah i mean as an individual i prefer that there are more Bitcoin exchanges, right? Like from a business perspective, I've, yeah, I'd want less. But even even from a business perspective, uh, it's good that there are more Bitcoin only exchanges. It's that concept. Like uh, I'll tell you, I'll, I'll put, get an example in place. Right outside my school back in India, there used to be a single shop that used to sell toys, and then soon there were like five shops that are selling toys. Like there's just five shops all opposite each other, next to each other that are selling toys. And then that just became a hub. Like, oh, you need to go buy toys for someone. You just go, go down that street, right? Mm. So so the more exchanges or Bitcoin-only exchanges are competing with each other in the same region and they're focused only on Bitcoin, it just makes it clearer to the general public like why these guys are doing this. Like, why are they only focusing on Bitcoin? It just shines more light, I guess, on, yes. on Bitcoin. Yeah. That's actually, yeah, that's a good way to think of it, eh? Because yeah. 
Yeah, like I suppose when I think of say podcasters, I don't look at you as like a, a competitor. Um, we're colleagues in a way. Yes. Like and I actually learned this first from Joe Rogan when he used to speak about um comedians. And there were mm. some comedians who were like sneaky and they'd go and steal people's jokes and they'd hear the story and be like and then run on stage and tell this guy's joke and he'd be sitting in the green room and he's like, dude, I just heard your joke. That's my that's my that's my shtick or whatever I can't remember the term is. And yeah, 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 yeah. And what Joe does, he's like going, Hey man, we're all here to support each other and help each other. And um, and what he's done is just like bring a ton of I mean, can you imagine how much talent that guy has brought on board? And it seems to be a similar thing in podcasting. And mm. kind of what you're doing is you're saying, Well, it's actually similar with Bitcoin exchanges, because the more we see that there's more Bitcoin exchanges and they focus on it, the more the general public realizes actually that's really what matters. Yeah, hundred percent. And like going back to podcasting, I remember. Uh, I, I think you recently had Gary on your podcast. I yes, think, yes. Yeah, yeah. And like I, re- I remember meeting Gary at a local meetup, and she's like, "Oh, I'm just gonna start my podcast." It's like, yeah, good, go for it. And I think she had maybe one episode out, and like I was like, "And what are you doing about?" It? And I was like, "Had a look. Oh, it's just uh, just on YouTube." I was like, "Okay, I'm gonna call you this weekend." And I'm going to help you set up an anchor account. And then that way it's going to be like, it's going to populate on all podcasting platforms, right? Like, yeah, I don't see, I don't see her as a competitor. It's like, oh, more of us. Exactly. Yes. That's a yeah. weird thing in Bitcoin. It's really weird because every other business you'd have, if I was running like a share brokerage or like an equity platform, like I'm literally studying like who, who's got what sort of market share, how can we differentiate ourselves? Is it like service or fees or branding or what are we going to do differently and i think with the bitcoin exchanges here it feels like we kind of you guys are pulling in the same direction obviously ultimately you you are competing for sort of psychopathic bitcoin as you want to just dca because that's a nice annuity income but it is awesome how it just feels like the general spirit is one of like we're all in this together and it's a sort of rising tide lifts all ships kind of way of thinking so that's a that's a cool way to think about it i guess what we're also seeing uh, and this is now a question on the regulatory side we're seeing in the u.s right now some people have called it operation 2.0 or choke point 2.0 yep. and it's quite obvious i think globally i mean whatever label you want to call it that there is now increased scrutiny for the on-ramps and off-ramps and right. we know like peer-to-peer there's nothing that can be done but mm-hmm. people still want to actually live in the real world switch out to fear what's what's your sort of read on the way things are mapping out here i mean there's stuff around we've seen some exchanges here i think have some challenges i don't know what mm-hmm. you, if you've got any thoughts or if you can make any comments yeah for sure i think first it would be good for some of the listeners to know what operation choke point uh choke point is sure yeah 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 so i think uh i think this was in obama's first term they actually put it down in writing so they were targeting cannabis businesses and I, I believe prostitution. So the idea is like we can have these businesses running or like the so it's legal in in a state and then this cannabis business is running there or multiple businesses are running there. But what we'll do is we'll cut them at their banking level and basically just cut them at their feet, right? Like this, yeah, just mm-hmm. chop off their legs. So they have a business, but they can't operate. And that's what now it's come. So they're calling it choke point 2.0 for crypto businesses slash Bitcoin businesses. Right. So that's what operation choke point is. Mm-hmm. And yeah, we've seen, we're seeing that happening on a larger scale in the U S but you're also seeing that happening here because you get like messages, like just with Commonwealth, because with Commonwealth, I get a message. Oh, we are going to, Limit your transfer, your crypto uh, crypto related transfers to X amount in a month, and we're also going to block them without any notice to you, or we can keep them on hold as long as we like. And then I also, uh, yeah, and I'm also with another bank, and then I don't often use that bank, but I used it to make a transfer once. And uh, yeah, they locked me out of my own account. I had to, and I call them up. I probably send, you know how it is. You call a bank, you're spending several hours talking to a machine. <laughs> and then when you finally get to that person, he's like, oh, you got to visit the branch. It's like, fuck. 
So then yeah. I had to go, yeah, get an appointment, go visit the branch, tell them, yes, I know what I'm doing with my money. And then, yes, I wanted that $200 to be go true. <laughs> it's and, unbelievable. Yeah. Hey. Yeah. And um, yeah, it's, it, it's, it's something that I've, I've, I've long thought about because um, I believe that there will be a day. I mean, we can get down into CBDCs later if you like, but I yeah. think there will be a day when they can be programmed in such a way that it'll be like, I'm, I'm put on a computer voice now. You've reached your limit to all crypto exchanges. <laughs> you, yeah. you know, you, you know, you can't, you can't buy more than a grand's worth of Bitcoin a month. Hundred percent. So I, I think that's going to happen. I don't even think it's a question of if. I think it's a when. Um, yeah, 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 yeah. And I'm, I'm already like sort of sniffing signs that this could be like, like sooner than five years. Mm, mm. I mean. And probably within 10 years is like, you've reached your upper limit of buying beef. <laughs> oh my God. Well, not right? if we like, have something to do with it, man. No, not with the beef yeah. initiative and other things like that. No, <laughs> you know, yeah, but um, um, yeah. So, so, so on the regulatory side, I mean, you know, just from a business perspective, I, I understood just from other exchanges, there's always been, it almost feels as if, um, you're being treated kind of differently to other businesses, like you're doing something illegal and yes. the higher level of scrutiny. And there is that mm. sense. So yeah, um, it is a bit unfortunate to, to kind of hear, but that does seem, is that fair to say that's kind of been the experience? hundred percent. Yeah. Yeah. hundred percent. Like you, yeah. Try to get like banking partners in different regions and it's the same thing. Oh, crypto oh that recently there's like all these things are like silvergate or they did bring up anything right like ftx or whatever it is like yeah they bring up anything that happened in the last year last two years and they'd be like oh we don't deal in crypto and yeah. they basket everything like obviously that basket bitcoin bit crypto you know yeah yeah i mean i i can always see a day where they, they might be make life so difficult for exchanges that they go okay no, no you can have your bitcoin don't stress man Shh. You can buy this ETF, and then they control mm. the company that has the ETF. You know what I mean? And so, I mean, yeah. you know, and then you go like, "Oh, I'm actually, and I can actually redeem that." And they go, "Well, right. we actually, we we hold the keys. We, we, we're the boss here." Sorry, and I think I mean, the so you... sovereignty is basically what I think is 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 where the opposition comes in. I don't like without going too far down that route. It's just like it doesn't feel as if they are in favor of self sovereignty. Yeah, I'll ask you one thing. Like, what do you think? Uh, who do you think is the biggest crypto casino in the world? Binance. Yeah, so Binance has like yeah, by far, right? Like it's over fifty percent. By far, they're the biggest uh, casino or crypto exchange. And then first, I, I I don't know. I can speak for Australia and US. They'll lose some sort of license in Australia, and then US they had like this problem with the SEC recently, mm -hmm. and then so they're choking Binance as like one of the biggest uh, place uh, or something that's not controlled by the elites per se or by the, uh, and then next thing you know, like they're choking Binance and next thing you know, BlackRock is like getting an EDF, right? <laughs> so, I mean, it gets, yeah, it's not getting pretty obvious, like what's the agenda and like they want, they, yeah, they, they want to basically control the asset. So they're going to sell you paper Bitcoin paper bitcoin my god exactly i mean and i think that's probably why binance has been very smart i mean i, I don't want to give credit to shitcoiners but they've been very smart and kind of trying to uh, where they put their where their holding companies are and mm. where all these different things are i mean they they engage in completely unethical stuff like you know wash trading and all sorts of other bullshit which i think is just that's just got to go i mean that and i'd love to just see that that yeah. casino just burn down but in terms of like, they don't really seem to have like an actual HQ anywhere. And mm. um, I don't think CZ would step foot in the US because he would be arrested on the spot. And yeah, it's, it seems what it seems is that, yeah, they it's almost like TradFi is now coming in. And while some people are celebrating, I think there's also, you know, a, it, it makes sense what you're saying in the sense that, I mean, the timing is quite unusual. You've got this huge amount of focus that's going against these casinos and then suddenly the swath of like you know all the like the the who's who of the financial institutions globally are suddenly like we're ready now with this uh for bitcoin mm -hmm. etf mm -hmm. and you think mm, 
So it's very obvious in, in that sense, like I, I kind of want to say to plebs and um, just people like you, there's this almost like this window of opportunity that's shrinking by the day. Yes. And I'm like, get as much of this Bitcoin as you can, because I think there will be a day when it will just be like these massive handbrakes and they'll create so much friction that the average person might just be like, oh, it's just not worth it. Yeah. And like, I mean, hard to tell what, what would, be the outcome for bitcoin then right like w- w- would it go up would it go down if people are not allowed to purchase and like yeah that's an interesting question um mm. i think what we do know is that bitcoin is resilient and mm. anti-fragile no matter what every time somebody tries to clamp on clamp it down it's almost like they're doing marketing for it you know mm. um 100%. and so that's the single most obvious sign i think for the average person would be like hey geez, when these guys are clamping down on this, it's almost a signal that I should try and get some. Obviously, they can't stop transactions. Mm -hmm. And then we could also say, look, there'll be circular economies. But it would be, I think it would slow down. It would slow down sort of at least price appreciation dramatically if um, effectively for the G7 nations um, as well as the BRICS nations, like shut off the on-ramps and off-ramps do you know what i mean that that would be devastating and so yeah i guess that's what makes it a a risk i mean you know we feel like it is the actual code and the way that it operates and functions and its anti-fragility is is to me like it's it's it doesn't it's not risky because i can trust it because i don't have to trust the person but what happens in the next five ten even 20 years nobody knows man I think. Yeah, hundred yeah. percent. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And speaking of uh, speaking of that about the brick BRICS nations, it's uh, these nations are cl- saying that the U- the the U.S. dollar doesn't have any value anymore, right? Things someone pointed out this inter- interested thing that China was doing is like they were they had all this U.S. debt or they still have, but well, but what they were doing is they were giving it out as loans to other countries so they're giving it out to loans to like some other african nations Mm. or other asian nations and then these countries can't pay pay back the loans so basically they got rid of their dollars but now they have assets in these countries in terms of land or whatever they've built infrastructure bridges and then they can have a military base in there or whatever right exactly it's a it's an economic uh, colonialism really yeah Uh, yeah and then yeah and then these other countries are left with like this with the US dollar, which is probably, yeah. At, at the same time, something I learned recently that India is doing, um, probably not true, probably true, but very likely to be true is they we have big hydro projects in the Himalayas. Mm-hmm. And apparently there's heaps of miners running there. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Wow, that's actually news. Eh? Yeah, Bitcoin mining is also one of those things that like, I think it's, its image is actually improving. But I guess yeah, no, uh, what I what you were saying with just before we go into the mining side, what you were saying about sort of um, what China's doing is like, I feel like I've been like a lone ranger, just um, at least screaming from the mountainside and being like, China is like an existential threat, and it you know I, at least speaking with my kind of norm normie mates. It just didn't feel like there was the sense of urgency. And then Trump was called the racist. And then suddenly it's not okay because Biden's saying it. And it's like, yeah, this is what they've been doing in Africa. And I've seen it. And, um, you know, they they go in, they build shitty infrastructure with shitty materials, with their shitty staff, their staff. They don't do any local employment. Exactly like you described, they take their dollars, they're loaning it out. And... One of the, the 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 hardest thing for these African nations is they've got to make sure that they keep their US dollar denominate the US dollar debt down because mm. their worthless fiat is just completely up and down all over yeah, the yeah, show. Yeah. So what South Africa has done well, incidentally, is have very little US dollar debt relative to Rand denominated debt. So people trust the Rand more so than let's say the you know, Malawi and Kwacha or whatever that might be. So what they'll do is they'll go in with their US dollars, as you say, get that infrastructure or build it or buy it. And then when they inevitably default because it's full of corrupt governments, they will say, thanks very much. We now have an airport in uh, Tanzania, which is the, yeah. one of the most recent ones. 
and yeah. they're also colonizing Sri Lanka the same way. Yes. So it's yes. it's pretty obvious. But then you could also say the U.S. has been doing this in a in a very huh. in a different way, um, yep. where you know they've literally I think they've got like 80, 85 military bases around the world, and mm. um, you know it's um it's it's that's why I always say there's not like a, there's not like good guys or bad guys. They're all doing the same thing. It's just I think it's quite obvious now what's happening with China, and um, most people were asleep I think for a long time. Yes, on the mining side, actually, sort of. So that's interesting. You say like it's happening out there in the Himalayas, but are there communities that could actually benefit from this infrastructure potentially that could be built out, or is it all going kind of flowing down the mountain and the communities are like bloody four hundred kilometers away? So yeah, I mean these are. Uh... From my understanding, these are government-run operations. So, yeah, not local. Yeah, not by the... Yeah, the community is there because I've lived in uh, villages in the Himalayas. And it's like, yeah, some of some of these villages are, in, are totally remote. There's no road access or anything. The only way you can get there is, uh, like, yeah, you probably have to trek for two hours. Unbelievable. Yeah. Unbelievable. On a separate note, I want to go and find a snow leopard one day. But anyway, that's, just, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that's a separate yeah. chat. Um, I want to touch on a couple of philosophical things because it seems like you know you you do dig the sort of philosophical side of things, and with you know with Bitcoin in particular, toxic maximalism. It's something that's been kind of I've been thinking about a little bit of late, and we've got all ranges of it. Um, you know, I think we can all say that Bitcoin's are the only thing that matters. I think where the differentiation comes in is like, well, what's your approach? You know, some people are like, it's almost like a, it's almost like parenting. Do you know what I mean? Not in a funny way, but it's like, you got this very disciplinarian, like, I will not tolerate anything else. You step out of line, I'm going to smack your ass. And then you've got like a very caring, nurturing. I understand I was once you come in and mm. I don't know, where, where do you sort of find yourself on the scale of sort of toxic maximum what are your thoughts around the whole thing yeah i guess uh i've not been a parent but <laughs> i'm not a parent yet so but but that I'd you're say aware of. Uh, yeah i would say it's uh it would be like uh, my first approach would be being the nice nice version right like oh you don't need to do this man like oh try to be like explained generally yeah and then depending on how close that individual is to me is like then yeah then get the stick out i guess <laughs> exactly yeah, <laughs> yeah. no yeah it's... and then i mean one of my favorite quotes from satoshi if you don't get it or you don't understand it like i don't have the time right that's a like, yeah I, 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 it's I, very good after a while it gets to that stage is like i just don't have the time like you do you i tried yeah. my best yeah yeah i'm beginning to feel like you know particularly with orange pulling people it's can be a bit of a futile exercise it's almost like it's almost like telling someone they need to lose weight. Uh, you know, you can look at someone, you go, clearly you need to lose weight, right? And it's not difficult in terms of like intellectually knowing what needs to be done. You just need to move more, eat less, or eat the right kinds of food. Um, you know, this has been known forever. But, you know, there comes a point where it's got to come from within. And it's almost like, I think with orange pulling, it's got to come from within. You've got to actually like be open-minded and ready to receive. Yes. You know? Because if you, have you got your mind made up? Um, you it's I don't think people are also making decisions with their rational brain you can try and rationalize with people but I think unless you put in the time and there's this open-mindedness I think it's really hard and I've seen that happen like with few friends is like oh they're trying to convince their wife about bitcoin and then they're not able to get through but next thing you know their wife is meeting their old schoolmate from like someone they or someone they looked up to right and there's like oh you heard of this bitcoin thing and then then it clicks for them because it's <laughs> yes right yeah it's so yeah, funny you say that, that. yeah it, that's happened in my world man um, yeah, yeah. my <laughs> wife was orange pulled not by me not by me talking to her about it for two years but by um other people uh yeah, by listening yeah. to my podcast nice. Finally, like oh i got it so it's exactly yeah. the case it's almost like sometimes there's this aversion to it if you're like if you're you know if your partner's a, a bitcoin or whatever you almost like I don't know, like maybe, you, and you're not instinctively you just resist because you don't want this person imposing a view. And then suddenly the same message comes from somewhere else. And it's like, interesting. Yeah. Okay. That's cool. So toxic maximism and orange pudding. Yeah. I think, um, I think that's an interesting side of things. This is all about hyper Bitcoinization. Mm -hmm. It's not like, I mean, people will 
have different definitions. I'd love to know what you kind of think about it and if it's inevitable and if so, when can we expect it? Right, right. Yeah, I mean, from my perspective, I think it's, yeah, I'm not really optimistic about it, honestly. I think it's going to take a while. I think there's going to be lots of struggle from now to when we actually get go into a Bitcoinized world. There's going to be, yeah, probably, yeah, there's lots of struggle, lots of chaos before we get there. The people that control the money supply and the people that are, the, and they are the people that are in power, they're not going to let that go easily. There's going to be a big fight. And uh, yeah, they're going to try every mean possible to stay in power. So uh, to put a timeline, I, yeah, honestly, I, I don't know. I don't know how, yeah, how long it's going. Yeah. It's quite honest. That's quite honest. Yeah. It, it's, yeah, it, I, I agree with you in the sense of there's just, it's so, it's very obvious that we're seeing the signs of resistance right now to this, a clear shift towards decentralized, you know, whether it's money, communities, ideas we're seeing just people are trying to reject this overarching you know big daddy telling us what yes. to do and it's not obvious how long this game can persist yeah i mean from a bitcoiner's perspective or someone that's uh, just around bitcoiners most of the time spending time on twitter or nostra or wherever they'd be like oh i'm just surrounded by all these bitcoiners but if you zoom out a bit and you look at what's happening <laughs> just in the general world right like how many people like you go to a shopping mall how many of how many people down there know about bitcoin or maybe they've heard about it but how many of how many of them are going to be like oh like the bitcoin it, it is this thing that I, I need to fight for right and uh yeah there's probably a handful probably less okay. so but by the time the message gets true to the masses that like this is what we're supposed to do there's going to be conflicting messages that they're going to receive as well right like even while they're understanding this thing as bitcoin there's going to be like oh don't don't look at this bitcoin crypto thing because there's like look at ftx or look at this or all these kind of messaging that's going to be across yeah that's so, true yeah, if, at the same time like if there's going to be regions like el salvador or other south american pockets where there's a bitcoin community we, we, and if that starts getting broadcasted in a, in a proper manner, I guess we can come to a hyper Bitcoinized world sooner than we think. Mm. So. The more I think, yeah, the more success you see with El Salvador in particular, the more it will embolden other countries to follow suit. It's always like you you don't want to be the first one to jump in the water because you might literally drown. So you'll just wait for somebody else to get in there and then. Soon enough, everyone will be jumping in. But yes. yeah, it's I I go back and forth all the time because sometimes I think, oh man, this Bitcoin is just so inevitable. There's just they can't do anything. And like I just imagine because maybe this will, you'll relate to this um because I love UFC so much. I just imagine like these you know these incredibly resilient individuals who can just walk through punches and just keep taking it and and fight through to the fifth round and submit the guy with blood all over his face. Like, yeah. That's what I think. That's what I think Bitcoin can do. And and I think sometimes I think it'll be done over in the first round because I think mm. we're not even out the first round. Other times I go, this could be like 30 years. This could be 40 years. Like this yeah. could be, this could, we, we could be sideways for like a decade because 100%. there's like an incredible amount of resistance. So nothing is certain. And mm. um, yeah, but when you think, because this was actually a question I was going to ask you, do you, when you think about the future, are you sort of leaning towards the more pessimistic side where it's like the dystopian CBDC, you know, kind of uh, world, or are you more optimistic? Pessimistic. Yeah. There we go. Yeah. 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 It's, um, <laughs> yeah. Is it, I mean, it, uh... I, I sent you something that I recently wrote. I don't think you had a, I mean, yeah, it was just like 10 minutes before we actually got recording, right? Yeah. Uh, but yeah, it's like a, yeah, that's a weird concept that I, yeah, just came out of my head and put it down on paper. Anyways, uh, j just looking at the way we are going with the technology we are creating at the moment is we have, like Apple is releasing this new ski mask thing right mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so i mean like five years down the line everyone's going to be wearing ski mask while they're on the road out and about 
they probably get sleeker or whatever, but everyone's going to have that. Probably have a battery pack in the back pocket and ski mask on. And that's going to be the world that we are living in, right? And we keep going down this technology path. And next thing you know, we are replacing our knees for robotic knees. We're replacing our arms and like, I, I don't know to what extent we could keep going. Because there's the chip, chip that's going to be put into our brain, then we don't need the ski mask anymore. And then we can get data stream straight to our senses, right? We can experience everything. So if that's the case and we keep going down this path, I mean, the information that we f that we feed ourselves, rather not what we feed ourselves, that information that we are going to be fed is going to be, yeah, it's going to just propagate like the same agenda that's still in place or not, or, or whatever that new agenda is going to be, as in CBDCs or this is the right thing, because it's you're just like a frog in a, uh, in a boiling pot of water, right? Mm. And we're gradually getting there towards where they want us to be. And I say of this hypothetical day, but like, you know what I'm talking about? Like they're gradually taking us in a direction where we want to be. And like, yeah, I guess, I guess like with Bitcoin, we have this opportunity to fight back. And then there's this urgency to educate more people about the importance of it. But we're doing, I mean, I guess we're doing our best to do uh, like to get more people on board at the same time. Like, it's just like, yeah. Which which one's gonna be the stronger force? We are we gotta wait and see, right? Yes, man. Yeah, those are some wild thoughts, and I I, I skimmed at it briefly before we we hopped on, and yeah, just looking at all those things, like oh gosh, there's some like weird things. I mean, even like the synthetic um, uterus. I was like, oh my god, you're like, I don't want to, I don't want to ruin my body. I'd rather just grow my baby in a synthetic uterus. And I'm like, what kind of world? I mean, are we going to be living in? Um, mm -hmm. There are, are all these sorts of things. And there is that sense of like inevitability about a lot of that tech, but I also am very encouraged by what I can kind of see in the growth of small communities yes. and people wanting, like just for example, take food, um, like the Australian Beef Initiative or the Beef Initiative over, overseas there in the US, people really trying to get close to the source of meat and kind of realizing actually, I don't get all the nutrients from the cow unless the cow is actually eating real food. And I don't want all this GMO corn fed garbage. I want like actual grass fed cows, which they're supposed to eat, uh, you know, and so people are now finding ways to engage directly with the suppliers. I'm thinking like, okay, so let's say you go to a school and your school is like pushing some sort of woke ideology and your kids are coming home and like, you know, with pink hair and mm. identifying as, as, as cats or something. You're like, you go like, this is bullshit. I'm going to go to a different school. And yeah, I think that will yeah. happen, you know? And so I also, I see a very bifurcated world. And so on the one hand, I think there is this world of just like a complete shit show of like a technocratic state uh, run by sort of people who've always run the show, uh, you know, people with, you know, deep pockets and that sort of thing with a lot of power, who are able to just control. I don't want to say like, I suppose the masses, the people who just want to literally, you know, earn a salary, get home, watch TV on the couch, watch the footy and have a barbecue on the weekend and do it all over again. Then you've got these other people who want to kind of create their own communities and go like, we want to grow our own food. We want to we want to live like connected, healthy lives. We want our children to be um, independent, mm. free thinkers. They don't want to be brainwashed by all this you know, um, government propaganda. And I'm also very encouraged by the media, man. Like what you mm. and I do, having conversations like, you know, these people had all the power. They could just, they could just tell lies, and um, there was no real way for people to know. I'll tell you one story. Sorry, I realize I'm talking a bit here, but my my parents actually, um, when my mom went and did a uh, like a gap year or something uh, in England, uh, she went to a kibbutz in Israel afterwards. But while she was in the UK, people were like, "Oh, you know, what's happening with like Nelson Mandela?" and she was like, oh, I'm not too sure. And then somebody said something about Steve Biko. And Steve Biko was like this very famous activist who I think he was chucked out of a building. Okay. Um, so he, they were resisting the apartheid state. And he was part of the, the ANC underground sort of movement that was trying to overthrow them. And they killed him. They effectively murdered him. And this was news in, in, in the UK, but it wasn't news in South Africa. So my, my mom, like, literally, when she phoned, home and you know you can imagine old payphone speaking to my the grandparents it was like 
like who's Steve Biko? Like that's the extent to which the machine had suppressed information. So, but you can't do that shit today. I mean, you know, that's what's encouraging to me, man. Yeah, hundred percent. And like another thought I had while you're saying like, oh, we're going to go into these smaller communities and like the communities are going to prosper. We're going to have our own food. We're going to be, uh, the community will be resistant to everything that's happening outside, right? Now, another weird thought. Just imagine this world where these, the tribes or the existing tribes around South America or wherever, right? There's probably tribes in Africa, tribes in India, or tribes wherever in the world must have had the same thought like ah oh, i don't want to go to this industrial world we're going to have a community here we are going to be self sustained and uh, and then this next thing you know is like this industrial world is like yeah just ran off in another direction and these guys are gone down a different path so in saying that so like what that would look like oh this bitcoin community is there where they have their they have their own money they have their own they farm their own food blah 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 and then there's just going to be this crazy world where people are wearing ski masks and have robotic legs or whatever. Mm, mm. <laughs> and that, yeah. and who, who's to say that's not going to happen? Yeah. yeah. It's, that's actually an interesting way of looking at it because you've got people that are totally left behind by the Industrial Revolution. And you could say that we, we, we might be the people who actually just opt out rather than saying uh, got left behind, maybe. We just go, like, no, I'm not playing that game. But it's really it's it's a very interesting thing to think of, and ah, oh, sometimes I just want to be like put to sleep and be like wake me up in like five years, tell me what's happening, man, because yeah. it's like sometimes you see, you see these things happening, and like because you you know you know the sovereign individual thesis and the way things are going, like I also tied into the fourth turning where mm. you've got these generational cycles, and we're kind of at the end of the you know the fourth turnings, and I or I think no, we're like I think we're balls deep in the fourth turning and yeah. that's why we're yeah. seeing so much chaos and so much anger and hostility in the youth so i think from some something from that will spring something really positive mm. um you know like various types of plant species need to be burned to the ground before they can ever grow again and it might be yes. i think the same applies with our society so but we're living through it all and yeah uh, I'm just grateful that we've got some, I think for me, Bitcoin is hope. That's why I like when I think, think about it. I would feel very negative about the future otherwise. No, hundred percent. I mean, yeah, same. I mean, the amount of, uh, yeah, if, if you're just open to what's actually happening around you and you have an eye for what's truly happening around you, there's, yeah, you, you'd live in a dark place. Like, you know, unless there's, unless you find hope in something like, bitcoin oh and mm. and people do find hope and strength in other aspects and like yeah and uh but bitcoin is like this this one thing that can bitcoin is one thing where you can truly take and say fuck you to the man right <laughs> yes yeah. yes yeah. exactly that's the uh, I'll, I'll clip that that's going to be one of the bits because <laughs> that's brilliant exactly because it is a it's a peaceful process it's a peaceful fuck you it's a, like i'm not participating in your games thanks very much and there's nothing you can do yeah it's it's it is that and then obviously we've got other aspects that we can sort of look at where it's like your friends and your family you can surround yourself with really great people who yes. can make life really worthwhile and, and and like that's really what the quality of life for me is about who, who am i spending my time with and since meeting bitcoiners like you in real life it's just every time i have a conversation mm -hmm. with a bitcoin i'm just like i've got energy man like Sometimes I find in the fiat world, because I'm still sort of straddled there, I kind mm -hmm. of I'll, I'll have a conversation with someone and I'll be walking along the street with them and I'll just be asking questions on autopilot and I'm not even listening. And I just mm -hmm. like to myself, whereas when I'm in these conversations, man, I'm so engaged and I get so much yes. value from people like you and, and the broader community. I'm going like, I'm just grateful. And, and it's place, really yeah. exciting. It's, it's quasi religious in a way. Uh, it's like a secular yep. religion, but um yeah, it's awesome. I want to touch on one more thing, man. So tell us a little bit about this jujitsu because I think um, you know it's it's a it's it's quite it seems to be something that I've seen along uh, with quite a few Bitcoiners who have to do jujitsu, and yeah. I don't know if it's about like doing something that's hard or if it requires proof of work in a sense or what it is. But yeah, like is there some sort of link between the two, or just tell us your story there? Yeah, I mean. 
I'll, I'll touch on one thing before I go to my own story. I was reading this book. It's called, uh, This is How They Tell Me the World's Gonna End or, or something on those lines. And basically, yeah, she, this is a researcher and she's been uh, looking into cyber, uh, not cyber crime, but like just cyber attacks. And and but it goes back to pre-computers, even like when the Russian and U.S. government were using typewriters to like spy on each other, blah blah blah. Okay. And then yeah, and then yeah, there's like the Russian embassy. I mean yeah, there's like Russian kids that gifted a U.S. embassy like a small wooden statue, but it's been chipped with like all sort of listening devices and all. And this is back in the '60s. And then you come fast forward to today, and then there's like governments that pay the most amount of money for zero days uh, for people that are listening zero days are exploits or computer hacks where uh, where they have a backdoor to your system they can switch on your webcam they can probably like depending on the zero day they can do all sorts of stuff and yeah just monitor your keystrokes and everything mm -hmm. so yeah and the biggest purchasers for zero days are nation states so mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah mm -hmm. And yeah, that just became a wild market with zero days and all. And uh, I, f I forgot why I started talking about this. But yeah, one thing that this uh, lady uh, uh, or this researcher pointed out is like she used to go for all these conferences, really underground stuff, like with all these hackers from around the world. They call them as white hats and black hats. White hats are the good guys, black yeah. hats are the bad guys. But one thing they all share in common is that they had they they trained jujitsu or they and they at, at this hacking events they had, used to have jiu-jitsu competitions wow. so yeah yeah and yeah like only recently learned about this but uh yeah so, so i'm not sure what it is exactly uh and why but i i, I can now go speak about myself per se it's like probably three years ago yeah that was when i started and i just had this i used to work out a bit i just had this drive like one day is like oh i need to go like punch a bag or something it just had like this excess energy to need to let out and it's like oh, i need to learn a martial art and i started like researching which one's the best and then apparently uh not apparently but uh all the early mma fights because that was martial art versus martial art it was not mixed martial arts so it's a mm. boxer versus a wrestler or blah 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 and all these early mma fights were always dominated by jiu-jitsu players like oh okay what's this strange jiu-jitsu thing and then i was like okay i'll go for this class give it a shot blah 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 and uh and then i was like watching some youtube content and he's like and he's like Ugh. i remember saying like or reading or watching is like for the first few months you're only going to get hammered and you just ride that through and then you slowly start like yeah getting less hammered and then slowly you'll be the one doing the hammer right <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah yeah so that's been the journey uh, and i think I think it's that the initial phase is like, yeah, just getting through it. I was chatting with another friend as well. And he's like, uh, his kids train jujitsu and gymnastics. And he's like, why do like, why is it like it's this most, so why more people are not doing both these sports? It's like, it's because this is, it's not like football or cricket where you get to kick the ball and like you're doing something. It's like one of the most challenges, challenging things that you're actually doing. Mm. in, in jiu-jitsu or gymnastics and like there's like lots of struggle before you actually can achieve something or do totally. something. yeah totally yeah i mean i've trained a handful of classes and i've got shoulder problems so i actually can't because it kept popping out but yeah that's so interesting man because it, it just seems as if there's this, like this mountain to climb initially and it's not it's not about using strength it's about technique Yes, and uh, you know a lot of guys who start it's just they just muscle their way out of out of chokes yes. and do all sorts of stuff but it's actually all just it's like it's almost like choreography you know choreography yeah, yeah, yeah. in a sense you, you can there's certain like defenses to certain moves and you think you, you're kind of laying traps and you're trying to get them comfortable in this role and then you mm. it's just it sounds so exciting yeah 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 so they call it uh another word for jujitsu is human chess yeah yeah yeah, because yeah. you're 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 probably like baiting your neck, right? So like they'll be like, "Oh, I can choke this guy's neck," but what the other person is doing while they're coming to choke your neck is they're letting their arm out of it a little too far from their body, and it's just giving me enough room to break the arm, basically. Yeah, but, yeah, yeah. So yeah, so it's quite interesting. I'll tell you uh, 
So yeah, I just randomly like I found the closest gym to me to, and I found the time that suited like the time that they had trained and yeah, I uh, the my the guy the head coach that I trained the gym that I trained at, uh, uh he's apparently he's the best in Australia. He's uh, he was the jiu jitsu coach uh, coach at Bruce Lee's gym mm. in the states. Sure. Yeah, he's trained with like with the early like one of the best wrestlers in the states or olympic wrestlers mm. yeah trained with all the brazilian dudes like yeah and then now he's yeah he's originally from australia so he's based in melbourne but he also trains most of he's trained most of the afl teams he was recently training sumo wrestlers in japan <laughs> it's a yeah it's really interesting it's just it's something that just pops up and obviously i'm a joe rogan fan so he loves yeah, to talk yeah, about yeah. it and it seems as if the, a lot of the guests that go on so subsequently like started it's like jocko mm. willick and all these kind of people just doing it and lex friedman and whatever and yeah it's just it's, it's almost like an intellectual game and i don't yes. think like people don't understand that and it just looks like sort of um what my what my friends uh what friend called aggressive hugging homoerotic yes. aggressive hugging <laughs> yeah 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 it's like it's uh, yeah it looks, they can't sort of looks gay right? yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly yeah. so yeah but i thought i thought we'd just sort of uh, touch on that one yeah, yeah. um yeah merrick uh, is there anything else that you'd you'd like the listeners to to hear or um that you want to share whether it's about you or about your company or yeah i mean uh any other topics you're keen to touch on or um before we close out no nothing nothing in particular that sticks out for me yeah i mean i don't want to I, in terms of a company I, I, as long as the listeners are going to a bitcoin only exchange that's that that what uh, that's what matters as long as they are yeah well, you see the value prop for bitcoin only and why and then supporting exchanges that are bitcoin only that's yeah that's the main focus like we, we have like as you said we pointed out there's like five in australia go to either one whichever whichever you find easy or the best to use go ahead and use them but yeah make sure it's like yeah bitcoin only support the bitcoin businesses and uh, teach your family and friends about bitcoin yeah sounds good man awesome well i'd like you to please show your podcast um Get a little, uh, because yeah, I think um, you don't, uh, you, you you're not a huge on these self promotion. So please show your podcast and tell the listeners where they can find you. Right, yeah, I, I think the best place to connect with me uh, would be on Twitter. I think you use Twitter more. Probably we should all be using Nostra more, but yeah, we yes. get there slowly. Uh, and my podcast is just called Merrick's Dabbling Path, uh, and uh, yeah. D A double B, I guess, L I N G path. And, there yeah. you go. I, and you'd have it in the show notes, I guess. Uh, Absolutely, man. You just got yeah, to okay. say, so, say yeah, it. So, yeah, I'm yeah. going to spell it out and then, yeah, you can find it in the show notes. Check it out. Dale was, I think, yeah, I, I, after I had Dale on, I recently didn't record anyone, uh, any episode, but yeah, soon there'll be, yeah, I have things lined up. Great. Awesome, man. This has been awesome. rad. Really enjoyed chatting to you, man. And, uh, yeah, all the best and uh, yeah, hopefully we can catch up in person soon. Yeah, likewise, Dale. Really lovely speaking with you. And yeah, thanks for having me. Awesome. And yeah, hopefully we catch up soon. You're, you're going to be at the next pushback. Thanks for listening to today's episode. I hope you enjoyed the conversation and that you got some value out of it. Either way, hit me up on Twitter and let me know what you think. My handle is Dale21M. If you've got any suggestions as to people you think I should be talking to or topics I should address to, I would love that sort of feedback. Otherwise, if you want to support the show, there's a couple different ways you can do that. The first is just to share it amongst your friends and family. The more that people hear the message that Bitcoin and crypto are not the same thing, the better. And I want to help people understand that. The second thing you can do is give me a five-star review on whichever podcast app you're using. Of course, that's only if I deserve it. And last but not least, if you want to stream Satsmoe via the Fountain app, I'm not going to say no, but it's not expected. Thank you so much for your support thus far. It means the world to me. I appreciate the hell out of you and the best is yet to come. Much love, friends. I'll see you on the other side.